<clears throat> so welcome everybody we are now live on youtube um, we will be ta talking today about guiding principles of business on business and human rights beyond uh, 2021. And um, I think we have a very interesting session before us. Um, in just a moment, I will hand over to our moderator, Hans. Um, please be aware that the chat is disabled for this session. Um, the, the, if you have any questions, there will be a Q&A later on, and um, please uh, pose your questions in the Q&A box. And we will... Please. Oh. Um. Welcome attendees to our session uh, on UN guiding principles on business and human rights beyond 2021. Um, I will hand over to our moderator, Michael, in, in just a moment. And um, I think we can start the session now. Um, Mike, uh, sorry, Matthias. <laughs> Matthias, Tons, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Welcome to all of you. Welcome from the IV headquarters here in Geneva in Switzerland. Um, to this session on the UN guiding principles, what has worked, what hasn't, and what needs to be done. I know this is the last day of the forum. Um, it is Friday afternoon. You must be tired after three days of online sessions and looking at the screen. So I really appreciate that you join us for this session uh, because it's an important topic. And I promise you, you won't regret spending your Friday afternoon with us. Why is it an important topic? The UN guiding principles are the authoritative framework on business and human rights. They are globally recognized as such. They have their 10th anniversary in June next year. So it is important to take stock to see what has worked, what hasn't worked, what are the achievements, what are the successes, but also where are the challenges and what, need be, um, what does we need to change. We have here an illustrative panel. With us is Dante Pesca. Dante Pesca is the director of Think Tank Vincular, the think tank in Chile, but he is also a member of the UN Working Group in Business and Human Rights. Dante comes and joins us from Chile, so I'm really grateful that he wakes up in the middle of the night to do that for us, and that is what we're knowing him for. Always engaged and always open for dialogue and speaking with stakeholders. So thank you so much, Dante, for that. This is also is Michael New. Michael New is the director for international cooperation at the China Enterprise Confederation, one of the 150 members of IV around the world. Thank you so much, um, New, to join us. This is Tomoka Hasegawa from the Business Federation in Japan, Kaiden Ren. She is the managing director of the SDG Promotion Bureau. Thank you so much, Tomoko, to join us. This is also is Greg Chen. He is the CEO of PTC Outsourcing Indonesia, an SME in Indonesia, but he is also very much engaged in APINDO, the Indonesian Employers Federation, where we are proud to have APINDO as our um, member in Indonesia. And last not, but not least, we have Salil Tripathi. He is um, from the 
um, center, uh, sorry, he is from the um, Institute for Human Rights and Business, I'm sorry. He joined us from New York, also for him it is in the middle of the night. So thank you so much for getting up for us that early, Salil. We have been very much engaged as I read with the IHRB, with John Morrison and with many of your colleagues on many, many different topics. We always appreciate how open the IHRB is to engage with business, to engage with business federation. So thank you very much for joining. I don't want to spend more time just to, again to encourage you to really use the Q&A uh, function and ask your questions all the time. We want to make this interactive. This is your session. It's not our session. And we will look at this Q&A very um, carefully. And when these questions will pop up, we will bring it directly to the attention of the speakers, of the panelists. So with any further ado, Dante, you have been not only a member of the UN Working Group for a long time now uh, already. So you have deep experience with the uh, UN Guiding Principles. The UN Working Group has been established actually to promote the uptake of the UN Guiding Principles. But before already, many of us know you very much from your engagement in the ISO 26000. So you are really long-term veteran when it comes to business and human rights. I would even argue you are the one person everyone thinks of when it is about business and human rights. So thank you so much for um, being with us. You are engaged in a project in a developing a roadmap for the next 10 years of the UN Guiding Principles. So for us, it is really important to see on the one hand, what are your experience about achievement and ongoing challenges on the uptake of the Guiding Principles, but also what are your plans within this project? So over to you, Dante. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, and everyone from the audience and the colleagues that will be presenting jointly. I know some of you already, so uh, hello from very long distance. Uh, actually, my, I'm in the absolute opposite from Beijing, more or less, uh, So, but exactly at the other side of the world. And um, so it's uh, 2.30 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning right here. Um, well, thank you very much, Matthias. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that um, well, you already introduced the guiding principles on business and human rights, and, and you rightly said that on July 1st, uh, the working group on business and human rights will initiate a full year process to evaluate um, the uptake and the lessons learned from the first 10 years uh, and to produce a, a report to the Human Rights Council understanding the dynamics, understanding the obstacles, understanding the achievements and, and, and where we have fall short. And we will also present uh, to the Council and to all stakeholders around the world a roadmap for the next 10 years to come and beyond and trying to learn from the experience, but actually project into the future. Um, and we need to understand what are the obstacles, what are the lessons learned, and how can we actually uh, address those obstacles or, uh, or impediments that have not allowed us to go far enough and fast enough. So our goal is to normalize the respect for human rights by business, not only because it's the right thing to do, and it is, uh, but it's also the smart thing to do. Um, and and under, under that umbrella, we're trying to think collectively and try to listen to the practitioners around the world to let us know, not from the abstraction, but actually from the practice, what are you facing in reality? What are the, the, what are the facts that actually affect why we're not making progress fast enough? Or maybe we are making progress fast enough, but we just don't know it, or maybe don't communicate it adequately, or we're not keeping track on using the same metrics or criteria. So it can be a combination. So we will be dedicating a long time to listen um, and to try to understand uh, from the practitioners at governments, at civil society, at business, uh, what are the practical dynamics um, in order to think into the future, uh, trying to move this agenda from the pioneer level where we are now, at governments, at business, mostly big business, uh, into mainstreaming, into be making something normal, something that today is normal in the Palais de Nacion, in Geneva, and in this forum. So we're all discussing about business and human rights, but when we move out of this context, uh, we have very little conversation about business and human rights, and we are, want to understand how can we unleash the full potential of the guiding principles 
but putting the special attention into the practitioners of the world, government, business, civil society, human rights defenders, um, etc. So we, we are right now uh, living uh, the experience of uh, the coronavirus and the health crisis. And, and it is something like an, a global scale asset test on resilience, on our capacity as societies to prevent, to mitigate and to respond to crisis. But ahead of us, and we will, of course, tackle this crisis and get through it, but it gives you us, all of us in the world, a very good picture of where our weaknesses are and where our strengths are. And the capacity of a society at national level, but also at the global level to work together uh, and to address societal issues or crises like climate change, like inequality, uh, like, let's say, um, and uh, societal issues that are of huge magnitude. Um, and those societal issues um, are, the same, are the same nature, are issues that we need to address in a collaborative manner. Uh, we need to be able to mobilize all our intellect, all our capacity to work uh, together, government, business, regulators, uh, the market, the investors, civil society, to listen the, to the voice of the ones affected by decisions but that very often are powerless and voiceless in order to bring all the players and all the actors into a collective action approach in order to be able to think into the future in, in a shared future, uh, in, in a shared matter. And then we need to understand what are the obstacles and we need to learn the, the lessons from implementation, the innovations, um, and where, what can we learn and, and get from the practitioners and from the pioneers, but to help us think, how can we reach out to the non-pioneers, the ones that are not yet there, the ones that are not in the same level, the ones that are not, they don't have, a, let's say, a sophisticated function on corporate sustainability, but are the more average people. My mother is a small business owner with 160 employees. So when I think about someone uh, that is a business owner, I think of my mother. What will make sense for my mother? Uh, for someone that is normal, a self-made uh, woman, in this case, businesswoman, that is competitive enough, but she's struggling today and keeping her business uh, alive, uh, so listening to someone like my own mother, uh, that she's not evil, but she's not perfect. And she doesn't have a sophisticated approach in business. She follows business signals. She follows regulations. She follows uh, incentives coming from the market, requirements from the investors. So she, more than being a driver, uh, which is the role for the pioneers, and of course we need the pioneers to show what can be done and to push the frontiers, but we need to think and step back a little bit to think about the non-pioneers, the ones that do not want to be the champion on everything because it's not their pretension. pretension. They don't aspire to that, but they want to be good in what they do. And, uh, and that is a conversation that we need to have um, and where to have it. So we need to know um, um, in how to create the enabling environment to normalize something that today is subject for pioneers and for a small group of believers. Uh, our assessment is that approximately three, four, five thousand large companies are in a process of embedding business and human rights or human rights by them. But that represents approximately two or three percent of the large companies of the world. That's only large because out of 200,000, and then we have medium, and then we have small, and then we have a huge informal economy, huge informal economy. And within the informal economy, we have an illegal economy, uh, which in my part of the world is quite significant in Latin America, let's say drug dealers and drug cartels. And uh, so we have different layers. So we have been able to engage very well with a group of companies that are mostly large, that are big brands in general, listed companies in general, and subject to more robust regulation, but also consumer pressure, investor pressure, uh, societal pressure from the press, from the stakeholders, from the workers, et cetera. But then we have everything else in the world, which is huge and massive. So we need to go back, that's our purpose, to go back to you, uh, the industry associations that represent not only the large let's say forward-looking pioneering companies, but actually the average business people. 
and the average company, the normal ones, uh, not only the big, but also the small, not only the frontier movers, but actually the followers like my own mother. Um, and we need to engage in an honest conversation. And that is a question back to you. Where can we have, where is the safe space to have an honest conversation about challenges, about obstacles, about lessons learned to help everyone else, regulators from the government, civil society, us that are leading this process, to understand what are these dynamic dynamics and how can we do better to move from the pioneers to mainstream, to move from some that are actually ahead of the core, and we applause that and we welcome that, of course, because it's the learning uh, platform, but how can we move from those lessons learned into mainstreaming, how to create this enabling environment, how to create a smart mix for regulation, for regulation and incentives, uh, how far to go in mandatory vis-a-vis -vis incentives, um, the role for large companies to be a driver and, and, and actually incentivize and use its leverage to mobilize its supply chain, to mobilize its, their peers in uh, sector-wide industry associations. And the role for industry associations uh, not only to be the vo the political voice, but also to capture the perspective of the normal business, SMEs, for example, um, and to be the platform for this honest conversation that we need. The honest conversation about what we do well, excellent. Yeah, that's fantastic because, of course, we welcome that. But what we don't do that well, and where are those obstacles? sometimes can be the investors, but very often it's just because we don't talk to each other enough and we don't spend enough time listening to each other in order to be able to, in, in order to, uh, in order to be able to address those those challenges. So the industry associations, the 10 seconds uh, role, and we have stated this many times and the engagement with IOE and Geneva and in many other settings, regional settings as well, is to set the expectations, set what are the expected, uh, what is the expected behavior for the members, set perhaps the requirements, help to set targets and link those targets to performance and on the ground being able to facilitate the monitoring of the progress made and to be able to capture the lessons learned and to serve as a platform for knowledge management uh, in order to really, really play a role to push this agenda, not replace the practical experience that business have to have on the ground, but being able to capture and to uh, consolidate that information and that knowledge, which is extremely rich uh, extremely rich and be able to use that knowledge in order to influence the, the shaping of the world and our future strategy. So we, we welcome this opportunity. Uh, this project is has been already announced in public, the next 10 years project. That we're going to have a launching event on the 7th of July. IOE is going to be speaking um, in that uh, global event for this launching from 3 to 6 p.m. Central European time on the 7th of July. And, and we really, really appreciate this opportunity to be able to have a dialogue with you and us or, and me and my colleagues, not as the experts that are meant to know everything. We don't know everything. And um, you know better than me, much better than me, why we're not doing enough progress or enough speed, what has been working well, what has not been working well, what a smart mix means in terms of regulation and government incentives, and what is the design that we have to build in order to unleash the full potential of the guiding principles. And with that thank said, you so thank you very much again for the invitation and I give the floor back to you, uh, Matthias. Thank you so much, Dante. That was really great. And we really take on board what you asked us to do as industry and business federation. Indeed, I is deeply involved in the roadmap you want to develop. We are very eager to engage because the business and human rights agenda is part of our key priorities. There's one question directly to you, Dante, which I want to pose to you. There are many, but I'll start with one. Is there any country in the world which has most effectively implemented the UN guiding principles? So can you name uh, and name a country where you think they have done the job particularly well. And then there's a second aspect to this question, asking about extraterritorial um, impact for companies. So can you 
two minutes, one minute, elaborate on that? Well, you, 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 you put me in an uncomfortable position, but, uh, but actually our reports uh, name some countries that are ahead of the curve. And, and in general, the countries that are ahead of the curve are central northern European countries. What is the characteristic there? Uh, of course, it says a lot that there are small countries. Well, your, your country is actually doing relatively well, Matthias, uh, Germany, and it's not a small economy and country. But let's say, what do they have that my part of the world, Latin America, doesn't? And, uh, and there is social dialogue. There's much higher level of trust. Institutions tend to work better. And they are in power is, hold, is held accountable to citizens. So there is press. There is pressure, there is participation, um, there is engagement. And, and I think that combination uh, makes those society more competitive, but also more resilient, more ready to address problems and to be able to overcome them collectively, collaboratively. So you don't have an enemy sitting in front of you. You have someone that might have discrepancies with you, might not agree with you, but also the social, the spirit of social dialogue is actually to be able to be sit in the same table and room with someone different than you, listen to that other person, and, and listen in a way that is a dialogue in which we recognize each other as equals, in which we might have disagreement, but we can actually disagree respectfully, looking into a common future. And those characteristics in my part of the world, Latin America, are not often present. And, and that is, of course, a problem. And, and I share with the panelists the report, the Corporate Sustainability Assessment of Standard and Poor's for Dow Jones Sustainability Index. And I, I hope well, some of you could take a look at it. And in the case of Asia, the performance of companies, the, the companies in Asia, by comparison with Europe, North America, or Latin America, do relatively well, are not in the bottom. My part of the world is in the bottom. Uh, but do they relatively well as an average. But where the Asian companies don't do that well is on corporate governance. Um, there are policies on diversity, but they are not implemented. It's very, very low level of diversity, which creates the problem of group thinking. So at the decision-making level, if people are too equal to each other and you don't have internal challengers that actually raise the difficult questions into the board, then the decision not being evil people at all, but it's not made with all the elements uh, in front of you. And the weakest element, and I was reviewing the report also, is in the alignment uh, with long-term performance and the executive compensation. That is one of the weakest elements in Asian companies. So when you evaluate the performance of the executive team and you reward that economically, uh, the weight that is put into the long-term performance performance and the management of uh, systemic risks like climate change or like uh, inequality is not integrated uh, properly and adequately because it's also not rewarded adequately. So if you say from the board level to the executive team, these elements are very important to address and they have a weight, they val they, I, we value this significantly because it's part of the executive compensation, it's part of the evaluation of performance for the ones that have to deliver on the ground. If you don't have that in place, and Asia overall is quite weak on that point, then it, even if people have the best intentions to address societal challenges, then they are actually incentivized to think very short term. And if you think very short term, you make decisions that are very short term, in the big elements and the big challenges of our society, let's say climate change or inequality, are, are of a magnitude and a perspective and time that are not addressed properly in the short term. So we need to actually unpack this reality, look at the data that we have, look at the data that we don't have, and have this space for an, uh, an, an open and uh, honest conversation on what the evidence is telling me and what can I learn from that evidence? Not to finger point and send someone, that, let's say, to uh, let's say to embarrass someone. Is to be able to learn and to understand why we're not making progress fast enough. And and maybe we will understand what are those elements, and that will allow us all to do much better because this is a win-win proposition. Uh, it's there's a moral case 
on respecting human rights, but it's also the smart thing to do. And that was said by the High Commissioner two years ago. So this is a win-win proposition. It's not an against business, it's a pro-responsible competitive business agenda. So now we need to get into the details, understand what is going on, uh, try to be open, uh, open-minded to, to see what are, is the reality, to listen to you, the practitioners of the world, and to be able to capture that and, and build this roadmap with all these elements in, in mind. So that's Thank my you. not too short uh, answer, Matthias. No, perfect. Thank you so much. And we will directly go and take your challenge when we go to Michael in one second. There was a question, um, Dante, to put the link to all your activi activities, this initiative on building the roadmap into the uh, Q&A function. If you could do that, then we continue with the other pal panelists, that would be great so people can directly um, um, benefit from that. Michael, you are part of the business landscape in China. China, of course, is a very important production country. You are one of the biggest economy in the world. But China, of course, Chinese companies going more and more outside of China. They're investing, they're investing particularly in Africa. So you have both. You have an important um, economy which is investing abroad, but of course, you still have a very important domestic market. Can you give us the Chinese experience? Where do we stay with you in guiding principles? Where are the achievements, but also where are the ongoing challenges? And what do we need to fix going forward for the next 10 years? The word is yours. Over to you, Michael. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Michael. You are muted. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Matthias, for the invitation from IOE uh, for me to participate in this uh, very important the forum, uh, the UN Guiding Principles and Business and Human Rights, which is a, uh, a bit sensitive, but a very important topic. Uh, you know, China, together with uh, all the other members of human rights, UN uh, Human Rights Council, approved the uh, Guiding Principles in 2011. At that time, uh, the Chinese government speak clearly that the, uh, the state, the uh, enterprise, uh, and all the judiciary bodies should be responsible for, uh, from each of their perspectives on the uh, human rights protection in their business communities, uh, business uh, operations. Uh, since then, uh, I should say uh, a lot has achieved. Uh, the, uh, since the launch of the guiding principles on uh, business and human rights, uh, uh, the, uh, the content of the guiding principles has been referred to by more and more companies, either directly or indirectly, uh, in the, particularly in the CSR reports or uh, uh, sustainable development reports. For example, uh, in, uh, in the, in, I can give you an example by uh, Sinopec, which is a very big corporation, uh, in their uh, uh, CSR report, it is stated clearly that, that they will strictly comply with the laws and the regulations on human rights protection, the National Human Rights Action Plan of China, and the International Human Rights Conventions. Uh, an another ex another uh, example is uh, a company called uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing International uh, Corporation. In their uh, corporate social responsibility policy, it states that uh, we will uphold the human rights of our staff and the highest standards of business integrity uh, as the ASMIC Code of Business Conduct and Ethics stated. So although these are they uh, refer to uh, the human rights protection, but uh, not directly to the uh, UN guiding principles. However, for some uh, uh, industrial associations, uh, they have this kind of uh, guidelines, social uh, responsibility, responsibility guidelines, like the China Foreign Context Engineering uh, Social Guideline 2012, uh, the Social Gu Responsibility Guideline for China uh, Electronic Information Sector in 20, 2013, and particularly uh, the Chinese due diligence guidelines for responsible uh, mineral supply chains in 2016 by China Chamber of Commerce of Metals 
uh, minerals and the chemicals importers and exporters. So they have clearly re referred to the UN guiding principles when they are formulating their uh, uh, CSR uh, guidelines. So secondly, uh, I think many companies in China have integrated the policies concerning human rights in, their, uh, in terms of uh, all uh, collective agreements, fair recruitment, gender equality, social protection, training opportunities, environmental responsibility, and so on. Okay. Uh, and thirdly, I think uh, Chinese companies, particularly uh, when they are going global, uh, including, of course, as you said, in the African countries and in other ancient countries, they have learned to observe the local laws and regulations, take into account the local culture and tradition and the environmental environment and the community, and to protect the rights of interest of all stakeholders. Okay. Uh, of course, as an employer's organization, uh, CC always advocates the government for favorable business environments and has been a very active social partner in promoting uh, enterprises to create more job opportunities, to build harmonious industrial relations, and to protect the legal rights and the interests of workers to fulfill their corporate social responsibilities. And as you may also know that the UN Global Compact China Network is based in CEC. Uh, also, uh, many companies, uh, companies realize that respecting human rights uh, benefits their business financially and socially, as Dante said, uh, it's not only the right thing to do, but also a smart thing to do. So particularly uh, in, in image building and particularly when they are uh, going global or doing international business. So I think these are some of the achievements uh, so far the uh, UN Global Company, uh, UN uh, Guiding Principle and Business Advice have achieved in, in, in China. Uh, talking about the, what has not or what has not working or uh, the gaps, I think there's still a lack of rec uh, awareness and recognition of UN, global, uh, UN uh, guiding principles uh, in China. Uh, there is no special national policy on uh, implementing uh, UN guiding principles in China so far. Um, so uh, there's uh, specifics of guiding principles have not being clearly stated and fully practiced in companies, such as the requirement and policy uh, statement or due diligence. So these are uh, only a few companies have done that. Right? Uh, secondly, uh, there are difficulties for large companies uh, to monitor and ensure that all suppliers uh, through the whole value chain and all the uh, clients to follow the rules and regulations as the company have stated. Uh, for SMEs, as the, U, the guiding principle stated, less capacity remains uh, the major hindrance for them to implement the guiding principles to a large extent. Uh, and the uh, next, I think for uh, companies, uh, they may have different priorities regarding their the specifics of human rights at a different development stages, uh, taking, in count, taking into account the reality of facing, uh, facing the company. Uh, for example, when we are facing, now we are facing the global pandemic like COVID-19. Uh, so many companies are, have to make a choice between survival and the closure. So this is why, uh, that's the why China, Chinese government always gives top priority to the right to survival and development. Uh, looking beyond 2021, 20, uh, um, I think uh, what we should do is first thing is awareness raising uh, needs to be promoted among business community about the UN guiding principles and human rights so that gradually the principles will be uh, naturally uh, integrated into the strategy of the company or as down to that change from pioneering to mainstream. Uh, secondly, I think uh, technical assistance should be enhanced for companies to put the, the principles into practice and the, preferably with uh, some cases of best practice. For example, I heard from the previous uh, speakers uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday about the uh, Coca-Cola company. They have, be, 
doing the due diligence among the whole supply chain. I think that's a very good example, which can be shared with other companies in, 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 to, to follow, to learn from. Okay? And with the uh, technical development in digitalization, business may be transformed, resulting in both job opportunities and the challenges, uh, like for uh, gig workers or contract workers. So you need informality and the problems of social protection and the social dialogue. So this should also be addressed in the future uh, with enough preparation for human rights protection. Uh, thirdly, uh, supply chain management in terms of human rights protection will remain a difficult difficulty unless more specific requirements are provided and international cooperation are enhanced, particularly when the globalization itself facing new challenges. At the same time, of course, uh, favorable business environments should be maintained and improved, not at the cost of human rights protection to any extent. Right? And Thirdly, uh, to formalize in the informal workers, particularly in developing ancient countries, which are likely to be exacerbated by a global pandemic like COVID-19, are very important for the protection of the rights they, they deserve. Okay. Uh, lastly, mm -hmm. I think uh, to, to turn the soft law, uh, human rights disclosure and due diligence into hard law and international treaties uh, legally binding will take more time and greater commitment for, for more stakeholders. So in short, I think uh, a lot has been achieved, but more remains to be done in the future. With that, I will stop here. Thank you, Matthias, over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was very specific, so on the point. So that was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Michael, I want to directly follow up with two questions, actually, which you can, might merge. You mentioned the problem of supply chain management and the challenges many companies around the world, that's a global problem, right, face to monitor their supply mm -hmm. chain and to encourage the suppliers to take up the UN guiding principles. The question now, would it help to have a UNGP mm -hmm. ranking where countries are ranked according to the implementation, what they're doing. So a company would know better and understand where are the risks been going into the country. Question number one. And question number two to you, Michael. In China, do you have information which are the sectors which are the front runners when it comes about the UN guiding principles? Which kind of companies are the front runners when it is about implementation of UN guiding principles? So these are the two questions. Mm -hmm. um, for 30 seconds each. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthias, for the question. Uh, for the supply chain, uh, as I said just now, uh, if we can uh, you know, learn from the best practices of companies like Coca-Cola, it will help us a lot. Uh, I know uh, the, uh, uh, some uh, large companies are, uh, you know, uh, following or observing the uh, guiding principles uh, the, either directly from the UN guiding principles or from the local laws uh, in China or in their investing countries, but it's really difficult for them to, you know, to, uh, to control the uh, suppliers, suppliers, supplier. So uh, that's, uh, you know, a difficulty for the uh, uh, large companies even. Uh, and for the smaller companies as a supplier, <clears throat> they have the difficulty of uh, survival or, um, you know, sometimes closure uh, to, 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 to choose. So that's a very difficult thing to do. For your second question, I think in China, we should say, uh, I cannot say which sector are, are uh, doing the best, but I can say it's, uh, it is those large companies, those uh, uh, transnational companies that are doing much better than the uh, smaller companies uh, because they, uh, they are all, always uh, releasing their uh, CSR report uh, for many years, including uh, the uh, human rights protection uh, as one of the chapter or is there as a, a part of their uh, uh, report. So, um, uh, but uh, I know that uh, the uh, mineral, uh, the, the China Min Metal, which is uh, a mining company, uh, they are, uh, you know, 
doing good in this area. Thank yeah, that's my so brief answer. Yeah. That was really helpful, Michael. Thank you for that. Returning from China to Japan and Tomoko, you have been very much engaged in promoting the UN guiding principles. Michael spoke about the need to raise awareness and that is what Kaiden Ren you have done for a long time. You are managing a part of Kaiden Ren which is particularly set up to promote human rights, to promote the SDGs. So you are really the first person to speak on this when it comes about that. So we are very honored to have you with us. Um, my understanding is you will have a short presentation of some of the work and experience you have done. Over to you, Tomoko. Thank you, Marius. Uh, I'd like to share with you some data. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so let's, let me uh, a brief explain about the, what is General Ren in the first, uh, at the outset. The Channel Ren stands for Japan Business Federation. It's a comprehensive economic organization uh, with a membership of more uh, nearly 1,400 big corporations in Japan, 109 nationwide industry associations, and 47 regional economic organizations. So it's kind of an umbrella economic organization in Japan. Then how we promote uh, human rights, uh, UN guiding principles in Japan. Sorry. Uh, it's through uh, the uh, Charter of Corporate Behavior. It is a code of conduct uh, comprised of 10 principles that general members uh, corporation press to uh, comply. So when a uh, corporation CEO join Kedera membership, they have to sign this charter. And this 10 principle represents Kedera's core values. And in the article four, uh, this requires all the Kedera corporations to conduct business that respects human rights and of all persons and understand and respect internationally recognized human rights and clarify policies to respect human rights. Then, to what extent actually our members are compliant with each other? Uh, we, had the, we conducted a survey in the spring 2018, 30 to uh, 1300 our member corporations, out of which 300 responded. And more than 80% of our uh, respondents stated that they already developed or are planning or starting to develop policies to respect human rights. Then, uh, okay, <laughs> we have to change the. Okay. 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 Then, uh, also, the survey also reveals that about half of our respondents replied that they had already adequately addressed human rights issues such as work environments, work safety elimination of employment related uh, discrimination and uh, prohib prohibition of forced labor and child labor and so forth. And uh, they already adequately addressed these human rights issues uh, and we, within their value chains. However, they also replied that they need to strengthen or upgrade their efforts to address all these issues. Then specifically OUN guiding principles. Uh, according to the survey done by Business Policy Forum in cooperation with Kedan Ren, target, target to 4,000 Japanese corporations, uh, to which 373 corporations replied, uh, we found out that around 35% of respondents are, are implementing human rights due diligence uh, in accordance with UN guiding principles. In other words, 65% uh, are not implementing human rights due diligence uh, based on UN guiding principles. So I think it's, as Dante replied, this reveals that big corporations are already uh, implementing UN guiding principles, whereas we also have our other 65%, um, mainly small and medium-sized uh, corporations that don't implement UN guiding principles, I mean that human rights due diligence, or in the first place, they don't know uh, UN guiding principles. So what are main challenges in the implementation of UN guiding principles in Japan? 
The first is that we need to promote recognition of respect, respecting human rights in accordance with the uh, UN guiding principles, not only contribute to avoid business risks, but also to enhance corporate values and international competitiveness. And second, we need to conduct human rights due diligence, not only to the first tier, but as Michael said, uh, to the second tier and all the supply chains in accordance with UN guiding principles. Then what is needed to promote better understanding of the UN guiding principles in Japan? Uh, these are the activities uh, that Kedan Ren are now planning to do uh, to promote the yeah, awareness and, uh, and implement implementation of a human rights due diligence uh, in accordance with the UN guiding principles. First, we are going to publicize and provide information on business and human rights to our member corporations. We will convene a seminar uh, in the big seminar in December. And also we have already supported to issue a Japanese translation, a Japanese version of the uh, CEO guide to human rights, which was published by WBCSD uh, in Switzerland. And we also cooperate with other industry group and regional business associations. And second, we are going to conduct surveys on our member corporations initiatives uh, in, this, uh, in this month. We are going to uh, conduct a question survey on our member uh, corporations to what extent they are uh, taking initiatives to respect business and human rights and also to implement uh, human rights due diligence. And we are also correct uh, in that survey. We are also uh, trying to correct best practices uh, or from our member corporations. And as Michael said, we are going to share this best practice of Japanese corporations am among our member corporations to assist other small and medium-sized Japanese corporations to do to follow their cases to do the human rights due diligence in Japan. And second. Uh, we will also uh, internationally disseminate information on Japanese corporate initiatives. Uh, so uh, we are going to uh, co disseminate information on the spe specific initiatives of Japanese co companies at the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights in, in November. And also we are going to co-organize a series of webinar with ILO. Uh, actually this uh, June and July on business and sustainable rate resilient supply chain after COVID-19. And lastly, we are going to examine human rights evaluation criteria by investors and rating agencies, because some, uh, based on the company's actual situation, uh, some Japanese corporations are not comfortable with the evaluation criteria uh, used by investors in terms of uh, rating their human rights efforts. So we, will, we are going to discuss these uh, criteria among our members. But lastly, but not least, uh, we need to raise human rights education is very important. We need to raise public awareness of internationally recognized human rights. Uh, so we need to collaborate with our, our elementary school, secondary school and higher educational institutions because uh, this is just for your reference. Uh, this is uh, another survey uh, done by uh, Kedan Ran that these are the uh, uh, human rights issues regarded as important in Japan. And as you can see, the, uh, the most, uh, the human rights issues are mainly recognized uh, important in Japan, uh, mainly focused on labor issues like work, workplace harassment, long working hours, or the issue of occupational health and safety, and uh, violation of women's rights and so forth. So Thank you. Thank we're you. asking. Okay. Thank you, Tomoko. That is really okay. great. That okay. is really interesting. Very, very good and important data. And I would directly would like to ask you a question out of the chat. Gender. Mm -hmm and the um, gender aspect of the um, guiding principles, how much do they actually play a role in Japan? How do you, much do you promote 
the gender aspect on human rights. We saw in the survey which you have taught to you that violence at, uh, at work as well as gender equality is a big topic. What, what does Kaidaran actually doing it? And the second question from the chat I would directly ask you is, if governments are not accountable to implement the UN guiding principles, why and how then companies should do so? So let's start with the first question about the gender aspect um, in the guiding principles and the importance of gender aspects in Japan. Uh, gender uh, issue as uh, human rights is very important, but I have to say we need a, we have a long way to go. As you can see that yeah, uh, in terms of a business that uh, we are, I, I think compared with the last like 10 years ago, there has been much progress that um, more and more uh, female are now in the managerial position or uh, even in the uh, board members of Japanese corporations, which is great, but uh, compared with uh, European or maybe a US or some uh, like uh, Sweden, Sweden and so forth, I think the, that uh, the female advancement uh, in, the, in, in terms of a job position should be more, uh, more encouraged and should be promoted more. So I think uh, Jap Kedonra and the Japanese corporation has a long way to go. And wh what is your second question? The question was that many governments don't implement the guiding principles. They don't implement the U UN Human Rights Convention. So if government's not accountable, how can companies be accountable? And I mean, there are a lot of questions with regard to accountability in the chat. In how far, I would put it a bit more broadly, in how far companies are accountable for human rights behavior? I think, uh, that, uh, as I said, that the, uh, about to respecting human rights and respecting the UN guardian principles, uh, is uh, will not only avoid business risks, but uh, will contribute to uh, enhance a corporate uh, social value and also co corporate international competitiveness. So I think a corporation should voluntarily uh, should respect human rights in business and also to uh, uh, to uh, to comply with UN guiding principles because that will also lead to. Uh, enhance uh, corporate uh, competitiveness and corporate images and so forth. Thank so you. Thank you much, Tomoko. Okay. Perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. Let us turn to Indonesia. Greg, we have met for the first time in 2015 when you had a leading role in the International Labour Conference discussion on decent work in SMEs and small and medium enterprises. You yourself are an entrepreneur, you have an SME which is focusing particularly on human resources and staffing services. So you have direct experience, but you also play a leading role in APINDO, the National Employers Federation of Indonesia. So you have both really the perspective of the entrepreneur, but also the perspective which comes wider by your engagement in the industry federation. Can you give us your perspective on what works, what hasn't worked and what needs to be done? Over to you, okay. Greg. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dante and Tomoko as well, Michael. Uh, I will start with answering some of the uh, questions that were in the uh, concept notes. So with consistent and a high degree of involvement, participation and training through the Employers Association of Indonesia, also known as APINDO, who works uh, with the ILO quite a bit, the government and other business associations, I would say that compliance towards applicable laws, regulations and best practices in particular that affects workers' welfare, uh, which, and which incorporates elements of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, actually has improved significantly in the last decade in Indonesia, honestly speaking. Although uh, the report uh, that was sent uh, via email uh, noticed that uh, Indonesia and companies in Indonesia was not included in that, as that re in that report uh, because of weak overall corporate sustainability performance. But overall, I can say uh, it has improved quite a bit, quite a bit in the last 10 years. Specific examples include our Indonesian Outsourcing Association or called ABADI, which I'm also a board member in. Uh, it consists of many recruitment companies, HR companies, outsourcing firms, call centers, uh, IT outsourcing companies, uh, etc. Now, having um, been established in 2009, they have uh, adopted the ethical guidelines now from the World Employment Confederation, and that would be uh, the umbrella organization that would be like the IOE of our uh, business sector. Uh, 
as a standard for all its members to follow. Now, if we compare and look back a decade ago, so let's say around 2010, the priority yeah. of the association was still capacity building or so. And five years ago, when we tried to introduce some of these ethical guidelines, there was still resistance from some members to adopt such ethical guidelines. But now, it's already an accepted standard of doing business properly, which means outsourcing and recruitment companies commit to not charging fees to job candidates, to not deduct employee salaries outside of statutory requirements like tax or social security contributions. And many uh, members now sign on that uh, commitment. Our buddy, also working through Apindo as a recognized employer organization on industrial relations, work with the government now on initiatives and policies and manpower regulations on a regular basis now. So um, all the socialization, social dialogue, training uh, through the ILO, uh, uh, through IOE, and many other organizations to push through the UN guidelines has definitely had a positive effect, uh, trickle-down effect to an organization such as ours. Now, as a majority of our buddies members have reached a high level of statutory compliance, our buddy is now also working partner with the government social security and pension uh, provider for employees called the uh, BPJS Ketanakerjaan or translated into English, EPJS Manpower. And when an outsourcing company is delinquent on their accident and death insurance premiums or social security and pension contributions, our buddy is actually contacted now to check if the company in arrears is an Abadi member, which is uh, a really good uh, progress compared to just three years ago. Up to early this year, our buddy members are acknowledged to be 100% current on all statutory payment obligations to BPJS, Kepanan or Manpower. Unfortunately, now this is to answer a question on the challenges and, and risks and what can be uh, done better to make this mainstream as Dante uh, uh, opened uh, in his speech uh, earlier. Unfortunately, in the last decade or so, the informal sector, which employs informal workers and where typically many human rights problems are reported from in Indonesia, still make up anywhere from 60 to 70% of the country. This range has not moved significantly um, in the last 10 years. And I think the key will be for the government to bring more companies, enterprises, and therefore their workers into the formal sector to receive proper employment protections and benefits. Now, we are, we are, I think, not at the stage of Japan yet, where you already have, you can actually uh, provide data on uh, gender gaps, on, uh, on such uh, finest details and niches. We are still at the uh, survival and, and, and compliance rate or not. And, and that's the stage we're still in. So I think the focus should really be on acquisitions of informal employers into the formal sector instead of just enforcement of employers already in the formal sector as it is now. As again, formal sector workers, our employers are hard pressed. It's very difficult for us, companies like me and companies in our association to compete against enterprises in the informal sector who do not pay taxes, do not recognize prevailing minimum wages. You know, this is very basic stuff and generally do not comply with many laws and regulations, which obviously uh, increases the cost of compliance if we have to comply and naturally the cost of doing business. So companies in the formal sector who have to follow all these uh, rules and we're okay with it. Obviously, there's a cost to that, and that is reflected in the prices of our products and services. If we have to compete against companies in the informal sector, obviously, it's much more difficult to maintain uh, such a high standard. Now, to give you an idea, so there are some numbers out there as well. Our body, our outsourcing association, again, has around 90 to 100 members at any given point in time. But that is out of a population of around 6,000 private placement companies in Indonesia. Uh, I think that's the last data available last year from the Manpower Ministry. Apindo has around over 14,000 companies as members nationwide out of a population of around 200,000 to over 5 million enterprises or entrepreneurs, depending on which ministry or which uh, media outlet you ask. So certainly the opportunity and risk to human rights is very clear. Uh, while Abedi and Apindo members consist of large multinationals to SMEs as members, uh, Abedi just makes up over 1% or so, and Apindo members are just around 0.2 to over 7% of their respected, respective rep represented population. So again, um, uh, what, what we say in Indonesia is sometimes you're hunting in the zoo. The, the world is a lot larger, but uh, members in Apindo and Abadi who really strive to uh, comply with all the regulations and also uh, implement best practices, embed them into their operations, is still a very small uh, subset of the entire population. Now, me myself, as an SME employer and board member also of Abadi and Apindo, I, guess I can say that a clear set of rules and enforcement of such rules for enterprises are critical for the long-term competitiveness and sustainability of enterprises in general, and for human rights in companies to really thrive. 
by taking good care of our workers. Uh, our company in turn is taking good care by our workers as every stakeholder feels more responsible and accountable. But of course, uh, I wish that would be the case uh, 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 overall in a marketplace. And to answer Dante's question in his opening remarks, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights has been translated, generally speaking, into government regulations and accepted uh, by the formal sectors for the most part. So if you go through Apindo or the events, that's already pretty much embedded into the mindset of many of its members. But the formal sector is unfortunately a lake compared to the sea that is the informal sectors. So the enabling environment, I think, is generally the government's primary responsibility, uh, to Matthias's point. Uh, and a ranking performed by an independent party, I think would be really, really, really helpful. Uh, we all know that many multinationals with operations in multiple countries have such rankings already as part of their evaluation process before entering new markets and engaging with local suppliers and partners. But again, I think the, the main focus would be how to get uh, more informal sectors and companies, enterprises into the formal sector so you can actually track them. Right? If we track uh, just our members in the formal sector, which is uh, a, a minute percentage of the overall population. Again, uh, the impact can be large, but uh, certainly a lot of work uh, still needs to be done because uh, once again, if you talk to the government officials, 60 to 70% of our economy is still made up of informal enterprises and informal workers, unfortunately, who has never heard of these guiding principles. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. That was again spot on and I really can say the informal sector is a huge problem, not only in Indonesia, not only in Asia, but in many countries around the world. It is in the informal sector where the decent work risks, of course, the greatest. And although we all agree what needs to be done, there is an ILO recommendation on in the informal sector. The focus is not yet there in national policy making. Um, Greg, one question to you. Today is the World Day Against Child Labor, and there is a question in the chat. How do you link the UN guiding principle agenda together with the child labor agenda, right? How do you make, make linkages between implementing the UNGPs and at the same time fighting and eradicate child labor? Any thoughts on that beyond um, fighting the informal sector? Uh, that's a good question. I will uh, refer to uh, some incidences that has happened uh, that has been widely reported in the media and the ILO is also well aware of and also um, uh, sampling uh, information based on what I saw in the field as well. So. When you talk about child labor, it's already very clear. There's already a rule, there's already laws in place. Uh, they are very clear as to the minimum age uh, to actually work uh, full time uh, at, a, at a company. It's like 18 years old, so it's clear. Many companies are aware, and so they completely avoid that. That's, uh, that's a non-issue in many cases, in almost all cases in the formal sector. Now, I take you guys back a few years ago. There was a big case where a lot of um, uh, workers in the informal sector, or they use uh, a shell company uh, that's that's properly established, but it's actually a shell company to employ forced labor from overseas, migrant workers, and also some child laborers as well, unfortunately. It was well documented. Uh, it became a huge case in the ASEAN region, not only Indonesia, because some of the forced uh, migrant workers came from neighboring countries, uh, and then it was uh, resolved. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I can say that when I visited uh, one, of the, um, one of our beautiful islands uh, in Indonesia, um, as a tourist, as a local tourist, um, I, I was in, uh, with my wife, uh, with a tour guide. We were sitting and having lunch, and then I saw a bunch of children playing, uh, working uh, in, a, in a farm field, right? There's like maybe 10 to 20 kids or so, uh, definitely below uh, anywhere between 7 to 15 years old, they're just working. And I asked them, uh, I asked the tour guide, you know, what are they doing? And they said, well, they're working part time to help the farmer. I said, well, um, doesn't the farmer have work as well? The farmers. Uh, cannot employ uh, full-time workers. The full-time, the, the adults are all going to the city. The young teenagers and, and, and young adults are moving to the big cities to find work. So they need uh, helping hands. So they would pay um, some, um, some uh, small income to children of their neighbors to help out in the farm. Well, and to me, of course, uh, the question would be, is that violating uh, child labor rights? But if you talk to the farmer, then you'll say, well, then you don't get your your rice, your, your grains, because there's nobody to help out in the field. It's a win-win situation. It's not affecting their homework. They, they are working only after they return from school. It's like a part-time job in the United States, right? So those are the things that are still happening pretty widespread in a country like Indonesia. How do you differentiate that? Where, where, do, you, where do you draw the line, for example, right? So if that's the exact question, 
And again, if you go back to the formal sector, it's, an, it's almost a non-issue these days. But if you go to the informal sector, which is, again, a much larger part of our economy, that is still pretty widespread. And if you talk to the, um, the people who are affected, the children, the, the parents of the children, everybody's okay with it because they're seeing it as helping out. They're earning some extra income on the side. It's not a full-time job. Uh, so they are not seeing that they're breaking any, anything uh, ethically or legally. Hope that answers the question. Absolutely, absolutely. And it really points to the gray zones we often see, right? That of course, people go to school, that is the most important one, and they can do their homework, but they also support their families. Um, funnily enough, because today, the, as I said, the, the World Day Against Child Labor just looked at some numbers that there are 630 million people which um, cannot read and write. And two thirds of them went to school, but of school, school is not. Uh, um, um, helpful in any case for many reasons and one of them of course is people are hungry people can are not able to focus during school times because they are working uh, in the evening and during the afternoon so it's a really a topic which we have to uh, focus more on in the future coming to salil salil again thank you so much um, for joining us so early in your time in york um, for us, it's really important to listen to your voice for two reasons. The first one, of course, you are a real expert. You're a real expert on human rights and the issue about the regions and the issue we have in the region, I mean, sorry. But on the same time, we cannot have the conversation only within the business community, right? Companies speaking to each other is important. It's important, important in terms of peer learning, but we need to be challenged by you. We need to be challenged by you, the voice of civil society, the voice of academics who can tell us it's good what you're doing, but here's a problem where you need to do better. So the question to you also, what are the successes so far? Where do we do good as business? But where are the challenges? And going forward for the roadmap, what do you see needs to happen in the next 10 years? So Salil, thank you again and over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. And it's been fascinating listening to everybody. And yes, the coffee has kept me going. So. It's, a, it's now 4.30 in the morning here in New York. So yeah, uh, 10th anniversary, I think is a very good time to take stock of where we are. Uh, it's a good time, it's a good number. It's a good way to look at where things stand, where, how far we have come and uh, what we need to do to get it better. Now have the guiding principles work. While we've been all been talking, I've also been keeping track of the questions and there's a pattern that's emerging in those questions. So I will try to refer to some of that in my responses as well. So first of all, there is a lot to be proud of. If we were to take a stock of the companies that have adhered to principles by having policies, you know, 20 years ago when I started this work at Amnesty International, it was very hard to get companies even to accept the idea that you need a human rights policy. They said, oh, but why do we need that? We have human resources policy. We have a corporate social responsibility policy. Why do we need human rights policies? We do now know that there are lots of companies that have the policy. When Global Compact started, there were only 50 companies. Today, there are seven, 8,000 companies which have at least adhered, at claim to adhere to the principle. Due diligence is a phrase that has moved beyond um, you know, the legal and financial compliance into the human rights phase. More and more companies are attempting to do the assessments. They are joining initiatives, conferences like this take place. There's greater awareness of the national contact points. Conversations are increasing. Um, many of us meet in Geneva every year at the UN Forum, and it's an, a fantastic opportunity to hear what people are doing and so on. The working group has been extremely active on some of the cutting edge issues. There's a greater awareness of human rights defenders. Companies are speaking up for them. Companies are saying we will attend trials. We are promising not to do what are called the SLAPP, the Strategic Legal Action Lawsuits against them. There's much greater awareness on gender, on LGBT rights. The Black Lives Matter movement has shown that race is an important issue. Companies are stepping up on the climate issue, on environment. And even after COVID, a lot of companies have acted very well. So that's on the plus side. That's very good. But there's always a but, right? Otherwise, uh, uh, we wouldn't be here. Otherwise, we would have declared victory. And you know, I would have been sleeping, and you would have been having a nice uh, party somewhere, and which is all great, which is exactly what we should be doing. But we are not in that situation. Uh, just in the last 10 years alone, if we look at Asia Pacific, we've had some horrendous instances. We know the tragedy of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, where a building collapsed and 1,100 people died there at that time. I don't want to go into finger pointing and blaming and so on, but it was a horrendous incident that did occur in South Asia. 
Uh, we also know of disasters of huge magnitude that continue to take place. Companies which are dealing with the COVID crisis, some of them have acted in a, in a sensible way, especially in countries which do have good social and, environment and social protection systems in place by having furloughs and so on. But in many places, people have just been let go without any recourse to what they should do. Uh, the most horrendous crisis, again, was in India, where a lot of migrant workers had to walk home and some of them died in the process. Some of them have gone back, may not return, and so on. People who are in the so-called gig work, which is supposed to give a lot more flexibility, are far more vulnerable. If you look at the ILO decent work agenda, uh, if someone is working as a ride-sharing driver, if someone is a delivery person for a company, they are in vulnerable situations. Who an essential worker is, the whole coronavirus crisis has told us to look at it again uh, with fresh eyes, because what we thought of as an essential worker, you know, a scientist, um, uh, and all of that is important, and they could work from home, but we couldn't have functioned, you know, if uh, grocery deliveries didn't come to us, if we didn't have pharmacies delivering drugs to us, if we didn't have people stocking meat in the right way in the meatpacking industries and so on. So we have a, we still have a long way to go and looking at it again. So Rana Plaza in one example, again in the neighborhood of this region in Asia, I'm talking about Boinka Cake Lake, uh, Boinka Lake example in Cambodia is an instance where land acquisition has been a continuous problem. Migrant workers is an issue that affect internally in countries like India, but also externally when you look at uh, what happened in the Middle East, what happened in Malaysia and Singapore. We also have broader questions, which we don't, haven't talked about yet. We have talked about gender dimension from the sexual violence and uh, discrimination angle, but the whole Me Too scandal, which was such a big issue in, in, in the Western world and elsewhere, is an important one for companies to bear in mind. Um, coronavirus has exposed us to the whole idea of uh, tracing, uh, because you know we need to know who, know who has met whom to know, the, know what has happened to the person and whether they're carrying uh, or they're asymptomatic or otherwise carriers of the disease. But that kind of tracing has significant implications on privacy. It leads to a model of surveillance. That surveillance is big when it comes to facial recognition. We know the situation in Western China, what happens to Uyghurs and so on. So we have many, many areas where companies are still undertaking activities in a manner which is often unregulated, in a manner where regulations are silent not known and the impact of their activities, whether or not intended, I'm not saying that companies intend to do bad, but the in, in, impact of their activities could be very adverse. Again, I mean, fishing workers, whether it is Thailand, whether it is uh, maritime sailors who are caught, you know, right now where 200,000 sailors, I'm told in merchant Navy, are not able to return home or go to a port of call because of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, we know of more rubber gloves being made, PPE equipment being made. Again, again, we don't know the conditions in which they are being made. So my point of giving all these series of examples is essentially to show that we still have a lot of work to do. So there's a lot to be proud of. The conversations have begun, but we have to move from talking the talk to walking the walk and think of beyond the global and local and think about impacts on the ground. And therefore, um, I wanted to flag why, why is it that the civil society continues to call for an international treaty? And this was a question, I think, from Nan Shepard that I saw about lobbying and public relations spending and where are the accountabilities of, accountability of transnational corporations. What I would say is this, that it's not just the TNCs which are a problem. I think our, our friend from Indonesia, Mr. Chen, actually spoke about smaller companies and SMEs, which also have a human rights impact, which can be adverse. So we have to, this, when we think about corporate accountability and responsibility, TNCs of course matter, but we have to see beyond the TNC, large state-owned companies, large private companies. I mean, you know, in India, the Reliance Group, for example, would be one such example. Um, a Malaysia Petronas would be an example like that. What are their impacts and what are the impacts of the smaller companies? So these challenges go beyond the transnational. Uh, there was a question also from Andrew Ku on legally binding instruments. And I think we are increasingly going to have to move towards that. We have to start thinking in terms of that, yes, standards matter, the guiding principles are extremely important, but even the champions of guiding principles, and I'm a huge champion, will be the first to say that they are not binding in the narrow legal sense. They're binding in a broader sense because they're being mainstreamed into stock, stock market regulations and so on, but they're not binding in a, in, a, in a narrow legal sense. So how do we move in that direction? And how do we make sure that we are moving in a way and in a manner that goes back towards the global standards, respecting the dignity, Returning to the idea of the most vulnerable and the most marginalized people, how they are being impacted, 
how do we mitigate harm there? How do we support SMEs? And how do we COVID codify some of the common standards? Now, that is going to be the challenge for the next 10 years. I think I'll pause there. Thank you, Sadia. That was great. And you already focused on some of the questions I wanted to ask you. So perfectly done. Great. Two comments I would like to make on this point. The first one is the impact of COVID. And we need to come in a second round on that one, on human rights, in particular also in the Asian region. What we have seen, of course, is that many particularly in the garment sector, workers are impacted by it. And because many countries in the region don't have proper social protection systems, these end up very quickly in humanitarian catastrophes. And I read together with ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, have taken some action actually to try to bring funding into these countries to support workers' income, but also business continuity. I will come to that in a minute. My question, but always with regards to this treaty, right? Uh, the funny thing is the binding treaty at the moment is not clear whether he will focus on SMEs, on domestic companies, because in the last consultation, the chair of the Intergovernmental Working Group was very clear. The decision, what is the scope of this treaty, will be taken at the end of the process. Now I take me out to take off my head as a moderator, but give a clear answer of the business side. This doesn't make any sense. If you negotiate the text, you need to know from the very beginning whether these texts is applying only to MEs or to all companies. And our uh, key message here from the business side, a treaty must be in line with the guiding principles and need to apply to all companies. And as you rightly said, because SMEs are the backbone of all kind of common economies and SMEs, uh, if you don't take them on board, they will lose many of the human rights impact which we need to address. So thank you so much. Um, we have, uh, around about 10, 15 minutes left. Dante, you wanted to address a question related on the risk of sustainability analytics. Directly over to you. Well, thank you, Matthias, and all the, uh, the, the other speakers. Um, um, actually, I have been uh, answering the questions in the, uh, the Q&A uh, in written form uh, already. So, but uh, but let, I, I want to address a few things. Um, there was a question on, on rankings and uh, benchmarks and monitoring. Uh, we Dante, we are losing with a small secretariat, but we will these benchmarking agencies, risk analysts, to step into this field and to provide, to collect data, to provide analysis, to do the crunching of numbers and to and to show and to compete in that market. Uh, so we uh, we welcome the different different players wearing the different hats to step into the monitoring, the learning, the lessons learned, the uh, data analysis, etc. And we, of course, we give the floor for them to uh, participate in our different settings, forums, etc. Um, but we we are not doing that. We will try to take stock uh, on what is our, around there already. And of course, we welcome contributions. Since uh, Tuesday this week, we have been out in the public making an open call for contributions. And contributions can be on sub substance, but it can also be, let's say, on analysis, on data, on uh, benchmarks, et cetera. So we welcome all, all players. There was another question about if the roadmap that we're thinking about is one global roadmap or there are going to be uh, region specific approaches. And the answer is yes, there will be region specific approaches and we will be conducting uh, consultations around the world. We have planned a number of them in Asia already with uh, UNDP as a partner. But uh, I, I heard uh, from uh, Tomoko in terms of, uh, of uh, Kaden Red of your plans for December. Those are opportunities to piggyback in that we will be really, really happy from all of you in the audience uh, to get invitations to engage. Uh, because as I said at the very beginning, we want to listen and, and we need the help of everyone on the ground uh, because we want to give voice to all stakeholders in a balanced manner, manner but we need also uh, to be piggybacking on opportunities for engagement. So we welcome invitations. And of course, of course, we're coordinating with Matthias from IOE, but many others uh, as well, some civil society, from unions, uh, from industry, other industry associations to do that. So, so very welcome. Um, on, on tracking on progress, we, there are a few questions around that, child labor, gender. We, we have difficulties to track progress, as I said, and it's linked to benchmarking, et cetera. So, but but we, we want more uh, players, let's say university research centers, risk analysts uh, or analysts of any kind to step into this field. 
and, uh, and to collect data, to analyze it, and to help us learn. But we do see a very important role for the industry associations, and all the speakers mentioned that already, um, which is uh, providing the space for an honest conversation. Uh, let's say a 20% time to uh, celebrate achievements and, uh, and of course we do have achievements and I, and I fully agree with Salil that we are making progress, otherwise we won't be having this conversation actually. So we are making progress and we are pushing this agenda forward. Uh, so that's, that's to be happy. But then the 80% the of the conversation is try to understand what is the underlying, of what are the underlying obstacles and where we can find the triggers to unleash the guiding principles to its full potential. Uh, understanding as a win-win proposition. And, and for that, uh, we need you uh, because we don't have all the answers. Yeah, We can analyze, we can look at it, we can listen, but at the end of the day, we need to, things to happen locally and, and the local agenda has to be owned by the local players, uh, you and all your respected stakeholders. And, and that is a conversation that we, we want to make it happen, we need to make it happen, and we're willing to engage with all of you on that. Um, on, on, on other elements and questions asked, um, I already answer in written form to the, the persons that were asking, or maybe it was in the public domain, I really don't, don't know, uh, but, uh, but I did provide answer, let's say, to SMEs, not much on that level, actually, I said we need to listen to SMEs and we need the associations and the larger companies to allow us to, to put voice to, or, or to give voice to the practitioners of the SME world. Uh, it is clearly a, a gap. And, and surely, as some of you already mentioned that, it is a gap on the informal economy because we, we have a, a constructive, positive dialogue and progress being made on the high end of big brands, sure. And they are a few thousands and they are making progress. But then we have the rest of big companies, the state-owned companies, which are huge and, and numerous around the world, uh, which is an expression of, of political will of governments, actually, medium, small, micro enterprise, uh, and then the huge informal economy and within the informal economy, as I said already, the illegal economy, which is, an, a, let's say, an uncomfortable conversation to have, but that is, that is clearly part of the equation uh, and not to be blind that that doesn't exist, of course. Uh, we, we need to put light on all the elements and all the challenges that we face and try to uh, together, collectively address them uh, incrementally but on higher speed and, and scale. So thanks again, uh, Matthias and all of you for the invitation and, and very happy to remain engaged with all of you. Thank you so much, Duncan. This was already nearly the perfect closing words, I must say. <laughs> we have still five minutes and I would like to use them really to make a last round for every one of the panelists to come in with its final observation, final thought for one minute each. And perhaps what I saw also in the chat is a cool question about technological progress and the human rights risk which we see with these new instruments, right? And of course, the question is, are the UN guiding principles, are companies, are stakeholders, are governments, are really grabbing the risk, but also the opportunities because blockchain, of course, but also a huge opportunity to have better traceability within supply chain. So I really would always look at the glass half full and half empty. That is my personal approach. So do we really grab the opportunities, but also the human rights risks these new uh, technologies bring? Everyone, one minute before we need to close, because we were asked to close five minutes early. Michael, over to you. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. How is it okay now? Yeah. Uh, the new technology, uh, particularly with the digitalization, has a great influence on the job opportunities and the forms of work. As I said, uh, with the uh, creation of uh, new opportunities for uh, gig workers, uh, they are facing the problems in uh, social protection. So as uh, you know, a deficit. So that will be uh, considered, need to be uh, considered in the future. And uh, also, uh, I want to say that uh, the human rights education, as uh, I, I forgot to mention, as uh, 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 our uh, colleague from Kedanran mentioned, is also a very important topic that we need to focus in the future. Uh, so uh, it, 
uh, as a conclusion, I want to say a lot has been achieved, but more, much more remains to be done in the future. So we need to um, make more commitment and work together for the protection of human rights in the future as a business. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tomoko, you already heard that Dante will join your event um, later on in the year on the guiding <laughs> principles. So I would really, you know, keep him on the hip. Don't let him from the leash. He has committed another night which can stay up. Tomoko, your views and your final thoughts. Okay. Uh, Kelderland is uh, promoting the idea of a society 5.0 which is the uh, new society that uh, utilizing the cutting edge technologies like IoT, AI, and also together with the human imagination and creativity to solve global issues. So I think it, I see it as a great opportunity to use this AI or the cutting edge technologies to uh, improve human rights due diligence uh, or worldwide. It can improve the supply chain management. So I think there is a great opportunity for us and, but I also agree with Maju that there is a lot wrong way to go. So we have to collaborate. Uh, the partnership uh, is very important. Thank you. Thank you, particularly also for the call for partnership because many of these issues are of course systemic issues where you need collective action. Where one company will not be able to solve it. One company will not um, be able to look at child labor, forced labor at the farm level when it is somewhere sitting in Tokyo, New York, or Paris. Greg, your final thought uh, on perhaps also a word on new technology. In light of the uh, uh, what we discussed earlier with rankings, I can say that our government loves rankings, and we uh, we are also challenged to move up in the rankings. So, uh, with technology already available, I think it would be great if we can have a ranking a system that's viewed by all that we can compare to ourselves and to Asian countries, other ASEAN countries and our peers all over the world. How have we have moved up from a formal sector of only 30% to hopefully one day we can actually switch it around and the formal sector can make up 70% of our economy. That would be great. And to see that progress on a yearly basis, how many companies are entering the formal sector workforce uh, uh, economy, how many workers are then entering into the formal economy as a ranking and as compared to other countries, like how we are tracking coronavirus infections now through Worldometer, I think that would be a, that would be a great tool for all of us to, to uh, uh, aspire to. Thank you, Greg. And Salil, you find the thoughts and also your, you know, your take on new technologies. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So technology is a great issue. It's a topic of perennial fascination. Um, three quick takeaways. You have mentioned blockchain. Um, blockchain is great for tracing commodities. I'll be very, very skeptical when it is being used to trace people. That's one thing we need to bear in mind. Uh, um, although it may seem advantageous, it may have huge consequences which are bad for human rights. Second part is the issue of data. I mean, yes, it's very good to know who might be infected to coronavirus and trace that but it's not a very good thing to know if a worker is trying to organize workers in a peaceful, legal way to form a trade union. So what you are tracing and why and technology in surveillance, that becomes important. It is also important about who has the data, who controls it, how long it is kept for, what you use it is being put to and when it's being destroyed. So these protocols have to be in place. Otherwise it creates a surveillance state and we know from the past, you know, whether it is, Germany in the 1930s and 40s, and you know what Pol Pot did in Cambodia in the 1970s, that can be very, very bad, that kind of technology in the hands of a government which does not intend to protect rights. And finally, artificial intelligence, uh, the point that Tomoko brought up, in, 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 and again, it sounds very good, but my, my understanding, and I'm no technologist, but my understanding of technology is that what artificial intelligence, it very smartly understands what we are doing, it very smartly understands that and replicates it and comes up with a more efficient outcome. Now we know from the fact that Amazon, which is working and tried to implement it for recruitment as a tool to identify candidates, and it started getting only white males as an example. And that's because the biases that were inherent in the system were multiplied. So there's no point in turning to a technology such as artificial intelligence without removing our biases first. So I think we have to think a lot more and a lot deeper 
before we start plunging into technology as a solution for it. Like every, every technology in the past, there are very good things out of technology, books, you know, wonderful thing we can read on, get ideas, but also the books could have mind comes in them. You know, and that can have a horrendous thing about what a book can contain. Some of the things can be very dangerous. And I completely yeah. agree with Matthias on my final word on, 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 on where the treaty should apply. Of course, it should apply to every business entity. I'm not at all suggesting it should only be large companies or multinationals. It should, of course, apply to small. We have to go by the impact of the right uh, on the rights rather than who is causing it. Perpetrators are important, but it's the abuse that we want to end. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're coming to the end of this session. Thank you so much, all of you. I wish you all a nice weekend in Asia. You already can go to the beach, have a beer, if you have a beer nearby. And we in Europe still have some hours in front of us. And you, Dante, still have to go up, so to say, and also you, Salil, in New York and in uh, Santiago de Chile. I, we will produce a flagship report on 10 years of UN guiding principles. We will consult with all of you. We will launch this at the end of the year. It's a major input into this project. So we are proudly, we probably come back to you with a webinar to present this report to you. But so far, thank you so much for joining. Have a great weekend. See you soon. Stay safe. Thank you.